Chapter 14 is a very important chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This chapter is called Guna Traya Vibhag Yoga, which means threefold division of gunas. Gunas are the building blocks according to Sankhya metaphysics. And in a way, if you were to try to compare it with modern physics, you would say that the building blocks of the universe are atoms. If you break it down further, it would be electrons, protons and neutrons. And similarly, that is the equivalent of these in Sankhya philosophy or Sankhya metaphysics are the three gunas, Sattva, Rajasan, Tamas. How they interact with each other and they influence us, our minds, is what this chapter is about. A very profound chapter. I hope to be able to give you a lot of good examples to illustrate the difference between sattva, rajas and tamas. Examples that are practical, that you can relate to. So I will start reading the first verses, verses two and 1 and 2. The Blessed Lord said, Again I shall teach you the transcendent knowledge, the highest of sciences, knowing which all meditators have gone from here to supreme adepthood. Resorting to this knowledge, reaching homogeneity with me, they are not born even at the new cycle of creation, nor do they suffer at dissolution. I have mentioned quite often that the Bhagavad Gita is beautifully structured, whether this structure was really planned or whether it happened intuitively, no one knows. But if you try to step back a little and look at the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, you will see there is a clear development of these 18 chapters, it is in fact the journey of a seeker. The journey begins with sincere questioning, doubting oneself and saying, hmm, is, 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 I, is this what I'm doing right? Are my actions right? Why am I so uncertain, so unsure? I need guidance approaching a teacher and asking for guidance. That is the beginning of the journey. Which leads you to begin with then understanding the basic philosophy, which is Sankhya. What is birth? What is death? What is the soul? What is rebirth? And these questions are answered in chapter 2. The following chapters then outline how one can change one's lifestyle, how one approaches ordinary day-to-day -day action. Goes further into detail once you have established a proper lifestyle, a suitable lifestyle, lifestyle suitable for meditation, you start practicing Raja Yoga, Dhyana. When you acquire some sort of insights, glimpses through Kundalini, then you, you actually have not just intellectually learned things or just try to integrate things in your life, but you now have the direct insight of pure consciousness. It's no longer just theory. This insight may come as a shock to the system, but it serves its purpose. 
it satisfies your longing for just a little taste of that divine nectar. Having had a taste of it, you want more, you long for it, and you're ready now to follow a systematic practice. So the following chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, Again, I shall teach you this transcendent knowledge. I will clarify, go into further detail. Now that you've had a little glimpse, we go into further detail and strengthen that what you have started. This practice, this journey, so that your doubts are removed. So this is the process which is then strengthened through systematic understanding and practice. And once you have that, you can become an adept. Having this at will and having an overview or understanding this, not just waiting for some spontaneous insights or glimpses, but putting in an effort and systematically practicing makes you an adept. Those who acquire these kind of glimpses, whether it's Kundalini or deep insight, whatever you wish to call it, those who do not use a systematic method, but are blessed or have grace, these ones are known as mystics. But those who systematically practice, these are following the path of yoga. They become adepts, siddhas. And such ones do not come back to this plane of existence. They do not suffer and they do not come back to this plane of existence once they have attained this mastery. I will continue with verses 3 and 4 before I take questions or comments since it's, a, it's almost a continuation. Verses 3 and 4 My Maya is the womb, Yoni, identical with me, who am the great Brahman. I impregnate that. From there the birth of all beings occurs, O descendant of Bharata. All the forms that arise in all the species, O son of Kunti, I, Brahman, am their seed-giving father, the great origin of Yoni. Yoni is womb. And Maya is the same as Yoni, which is the womb. And this is simply another word for the world, our worldly existence or this worldly plane. It says that this worldly existence or this Maya is the same as, is identical with me, that is Brahman. So these are one and the same. They are not different. All this is Brahman. Krishna is the seed giving father, Brahman. Again, this can be very confusing because at one point it says, Maya or womb, the other point it says the seed giving father. So, what is happening here? It's the basic Sankhya philosophy in which we say that this world is the result of the union of Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha the father principle is pure consciousness, is spirit or pure consciousness. And the mother principle 
or the womb is the same as prakriti or the world and that is matter so on one hand we have consciousness on the other hand matter in reality both of these are the same matter too is consciousness but only very gross form of consciousness so it says the father is the seed giving father it's when there is a contact between the two there's a union of two then that gives rise to all the forms of all the species so all the beings of the world come through the contact of purusha and prakriti in the last chapter we spoke about the field and the field knower is simply another word for the same field and field knower it's interesting how many different ways they have for saying the same thing from different um, you know uh, philosophies or schools there are different terminology terminology that is used so it's important to remember that you should not get confused by these different terms they actually mean pretty much the same after all everything is consciousness one is the gross aspect and the other is a more subtle aspect any questions thoughts or comments so far Okay, no questions. Let me just continue. We are now coming to the part about the gunas. Very interesting part. So, I read the verses five to nine. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. These attributes. born of prakriti bind the immutable body bearer in the body o mighty armed one of these sattva illuminator and healthy because of its immaculateness binds through the attraction of pleasure as well as the attraction of knowledge o sinless one no rajas to have the nature of attraction and color producing craving and attachment o son of kunti it binds the body bearer through attachment to action no tamas to be born of ignorance the stupefier of all body owners o descendant of bharata it binds through negligence sloth and sleep sattva causes attachment to happiness rajas to action o descendant of bharata tamas however veiling knowledge causes attachment to inattention so here the gunas are now explained in a little detail as i mentioned the gunas are rajas uh, sattva rajas and tamas and you can say they that they are the grosser form of prakruti prakruti could can be called pure energy most of you know that einstein's famous formula e equals mc square basically is a formula 
that explains the relationship between energy and matter. So energy is basically a form of matter according to that formula, according to Einstein, and it has been proved as well through different experiments. So you can say that energy is a subtler form and matter a more grosser form. And this was already understood by Sankhya philosophy or metaphysics when it says basically Prakriti is the energy and it immediately turns to the three forms of energy which is Tamas, Rajas and Sattva. There have been experiments done in these um, atom, uh, atomic accelerators at CERN in, in Switzerland where they found that if they tried to, to, to break down atoms further or neutrons further, they found that they in fact, the energy that was used to break these and to further down, in fact turned into other elements or other particles. So what happened was energy was turned into particles, which is matter, and vice versa. So at some point, they, they understood that this was like a fabric which was knit together so completely that they could not really take it apart completely. And that is what these three are. Tamas, Rajas and Sattva are very closely connected to each other and they are always sort of compensating for each other. One rises, the other falls. When one falls, the other rises. Sattva is an illuminator. It brings more light. But it, in that sense, it also binds because you want more of that. Knowledge, pleasure, happiness. Rajas also binds, it produces cravings. And the attachment to action. Thomas also binds through ignorance, through sloth, through sleep. So, all three have a binding action. Often people think sattva is, is better, which is true, relatively speaking. But... All the same, sattva also has a binding action. I will just continue since uh, it's a very similar topic. We could, the next verses, we can take a break after that for questions, if any. Verses 10 to 13. Overcoming rajas and tamas, sattva prevails. O descendant of Bharata. Rajas prevails, overcoming Sattva and Tamas. Similarly, Tamas prevails, overcoming Sattva and Rajas. When the light of knowledge waxes in all the doors of this body, then one should know Sattva to have increased. Greed, activity, the initiation of actions, absence of peace, competitiveness, are born when Rajas has increased, O bull among Bharatas. <clears throat> Absence of light, lack of initiative, inattention as well as stupefaction, these are produced when Tamas has increased, O prince of Kurus. These verses elaborate further the Gunas with some examples. So, when one is prevailing, the other two are suppressed. And this is continuously happening. When you experience lightness, when you experience calm, peaceful, relaxed um, mood, that means sattva has increased in the body. 
when you experience this need for activity or there's greed, uh, there, you want to you know, compete with people, that means there's more rajas in the body. When you feel dull, you have no initiative, no ideas, you're not attentive, that is, that is tamas, which is prevailing in your body. To give you examples that will make it clearer, the most obvious and simple example is that of food. If you eat sattvic foods, for example, light fruits, light food, uh, freshly prepared food, a lot of vegetables, very light grains like rice, nothing fried, then on eating it, you feel energetic, you feel light, you feel a sense of well-being. If you eat things that are very spicy, that are very, uh, you know, have a lot of meat or, uh, um, for example, the red meats, then you feel very uh, active, competitive, and that is rajas. And if you eat very heavy food, deep fried, old food, frozen foods, highly processed foods, all this makes you very dull, very lazy, sleepy. And this is what comes from these foods. It's a very obvious connection. And if you haven't noticed, you can try an experiment where you have <clears throat> fresh foods for, for a while and you see how you feel. You can have Rajasik food for a while and see how you feel. You can experiment in your life, in your daily life and see this for yourself. I can give you more examples. Examples such as gifts. Imagine somebody is getting married or somebody has a birthday and you have to take a gift. And you're very careless, so your gift is going to be tamasic. So you just find something in your house which is lying around. Maybe it looks a little worn out. Maybe it looks even a little bit shabby. It might even be chipped off somewhere a little bit. And you say, okay, I'm not going to spend money, you know. You just take this, put some, wrap it in some sort of paper and then just gift this to somebody. That is an example of a thamasic gift. What is a rajasic gift? Yeah, a rajasic gift is a gift where you don't think what the person wants or likes. Same with the thamasic gift. But you give a gift to show off. You may give a gift to show off your money or whatever it may be. So you give very expensive things. Or you, you give something which proves, you know, how, how wonderful you are. And it doesn't take into consideration at all the person whom you're giving the gift to. That gift is actually about you and not the person who is... Uh, being given the gift. And what is a sattvic gift? Sattvic gift is where you think about the person, consider what would this person like, what would be useful for this person, and acquire or purchase or make even a gift that would be useful for that person. And that is a sattvic gift. An example that really comes to my mind um, because of recent um, things that have happened uh, recently is in donations. I have noticed this a lot. You know, um, or donations or um, in service when you serve. A famous example is that when the hospital was built by Swami Rama. He said uh, very clearly, I don't want the hospital to have my name, but that of, it's called the Himalayan Hospital, because if I put my name, he said the tradition would beat him. 
what this means is that if you put your name to it, it is no longer sattvic work of seva that becomes rajasic. It's to show off, or to put your name there. So when some people, you may have noticed sometimes, somebody donates a bench in the park, you know, a park bench, and then they put over there their name. This bench was donated by so-and-so. <laughs> That's a, a rajasic um, donation. Or anybody who announces, I'm going to make this donation, you know, that is a rajasic donation. A tamasic donation would be somebody who who donates because he feels like he has to donate. He's uh, forced, he feels uh, under pressure. He's not donating because he wants to or he appreciates something. Or somebody, these days it's, it, unfortunately it happens. Uh, people uh, are concerned more about uh, the taxes that they have to pay and whether they will get some tax benefits. And that is a tamasic donation. What is a sattvic donation? A sattvic donation is made very quietly. Nobody says anything, nobody asks anything. You just make it because you value something or that cause means something to you. And you simply do it. I, I can just share with you that uh, two people whom I don't even know personally made some donations. They didn't... Uh, say anything uh, i didn't know them and they just um, asked me for a paypal account and they simply transferred money and uh, it was not a small amount of money and they didn't make a announcement anywhere that they are going to make a donation nor did they ask me whether there is any kind of um, tax benefit from this so that is truly a sattvic donation. Where you, you're not considering your own profit or anything out of it. It is purely because you want to do something for a certain cause and you find some value in that and you want to support it. So this is how everything in life can be seen. Our actions can be seen as rajasik, tamasik or sattvic. Your effort should be to be attentive to what you're doing and not to get into tamasic actions which are out of ignorance and to get into rajasic actions where you want to show off, be competitive, be, you know, be aggressive. So this analysis one can do in almost all actions that you perform. Even a simple thing like a question that somebody might ask a teacher can be also tamasic, rajasic and sattvic. If the, the question is not a real question, it's only to show off uh, that you know something, then it's a, a rajasic question. If the question is utterly confused and doesn't make any sense, then you say it is a tamasic question. And a sattvic question would be a question coming out of a genuine desire to learn, to grow, to come out of your present state of development and to, to develop further. So as you can see, almost everything, all actions can be analyzed in this manner. Okay, so any questions, any comments so far, any doubts? So I've tried to use examples that people can relate to. If anybody has any other example that you can give, that would be nice as a contribution. To think of something is always very useful so that people can relate to it. 
Because what happens otherwise is that the gunas become extremely esoteric. And in this way, we can relate to gunas in our day-to-day -day life. How about an invitation? You invite people for your birthday or your, I don't know, wedding or for some event. And you invite that person because you want to have more gifts. <laughs> I imagine that that would be a thamasic invitation. If you want to invite the people only because you want to show off, you know, you invite them to some very fancy place, um, you know, and uh, you invite lots of uh, fancy people or, or influential people and you want to show off. Well, that would be a logistic invitation. What is a sattvic invitation? Sattvic invitation is when you genuinely want to just bring people together. You want to connect, you want to bring people together and you enjoy that. Simply the fact that people come together. That would be a sattvic invitation. I hope you're getting the, the pattern in it and you understand in this way what these three gunas mean. Okay. Balaji, did you want to say something? Okay, no, I thought I heard you. I, I thought I saw the thing get become green. That's why I asked. I am kind of on and off, so I'm sorry. Oh, okay, all right. Good. So we just continue. Verses 14 and 15. These are slightly more intense. They're interesting, maybe we cannot all relate to it, but we'll try. Verses 14 and 15. When a body bearer comes to death during an increase of sattva, then he attains the immaculate words of those of high knowledge. Upon dying in rajas, one is born among those who are drawn to action. Similarly, Dying in tamas, one is born among stup stupefied species. It's very interesting to know. I don't know if any of us are going to be so conscious during the process of dying that we will be able to influence it. But the way is that if you learn meditation systematically, this is what you're learning. You're learning that you are conscious during that period of transition. The body bearer departs from the body consciously. That's what we aim to do or to learn. And if you can do that, then even at the moment of death, this becomes an opportunity to attain complete liberation. So if you are very conscious, that means a sattvic state, then you attain to the worlds of high knowledge, that is, you can even attain liberation, or at least a very highly evolved birth. But if you cannot do that, you die in a state of rajas, the mind is very restless and active. Such a one is drawn to action. So you get a body where you will live out further action. What is it? What happens when you die in a state of tamas? Tamas means absolutely unconscious, fearful, and dull. 
you die in a very, very unconscious state of mind. Such a person could be born. A stupefied species does not necessarily mean that you are not born uh, uh, as a human. It, it could be that you are not born as a human, but it can also be that uh, you are born as a, a, a very tamasic condition. <clears throat> so, this is a far deeper um, issue here about the time of departure from this worldly plane and um, of course not a very uh, pleasant subject for most people to contemplate on but those who would contemplate a little bit on death um, immediately you feel that Consciousness and being conscious are very strongly connected and having a conscious death uh, is, is really something to be uh, aspired uh, for. Any questions on this? It is a little bit esoteric, I know, these two verses. So, okay. The fruit of a meritorious act is sattvic and stainless. But the fruit of Rajas is pain, and the fruit of Tamas is ignorance. Knowledge is born from Sattva, greed from Rajas. Inattention and stupefaction, as well as ignorance from Tamas. The Sattva dwellers rise upward, the Rajasic remain in the middle, the tamasic ones, remaining under the influence of base qualities, move downward. So, these are the results, so the fruits of the three qualities of sattva, the fruit is, is stainless, in a sense that it doesn't stick doesn't uh, affect you. That of Rajas is pain. It leads to suffering. And the fruit of Tamas leads to ignorance. Similarly, from Rajas, from Sattva, all the good stuff comes. So there is knowledge. From Rajas, you get greed, you want more and more. And from tamas is only inattention, ignorance and stupefaction. So you can well imagine that sattva is naturally more desirable for those who are seeking to evolve or on the path. What you definitely don't want is tamas, ignorance, sloth, inattention, all these things are definitely would definitely be a big obstacle to the path of spiritual evolution. Rajas is somewhere in the middle. Most seekers are of this kind. Most seekers are Rajasic in nature. And they are seeking to come out of that Rajas and to acquire over time, more and more sattvic qualities. So not, none of us are really only tamasic, only rajasic, only sattvic. We have a mix of all. 
in certain areas you are tamasic, in certain areas you are rajasic, in certain you are sattvic. We will see how these three work together in the following verses now. When the seer observes no agents of action other than the gunas and knows the transcendent beyond the gunas, he attains the state of being me. The body bearer transcending these three body creating gunas, freed from the sorrows called birth, old age and death, enjoys immortality. So, as I said, these we are a mix of these three. Not, none of us is really purely Rajasic or purely Sattvic. There's always a little mix. And this mix does not even remain a constant mix. It's continuously changing. It depends on the food you have eaten. It depends on the company you keep. It depends on your sleeping habits. It depends on... Um, the kind of, you know, routine you have. So your entire lifestyle, even the environment you live in, influences these three. The composition of the body is continuously changing, the, as well as the mind. When I say body, I mean also mind. So, Sometimes we want to control everything and we say, no, no, I only want to be sattvic. I want to just do away with the others. You can, to a certain extent, by leading a more sattvic lifestyle, by keeping the right company, by having a healthy routine. But you cannot just do away with rajas and tamas altogether. Because tamas is the nature of the body. It is heavy. It's gross. It's matter. So there is a certain tamas in it. There is a basic nature of the mind, which is moving. The mind tends to move much more. It's, it's finer, but it's not as fine as consciousness. So it is more rajasic. It's in between. So these three, the composition of these, is continuously changing. How does one deal with this? So the seer, this is how he deals with it. He doesn't even attempt to control the gunas. It doesn't mean that we should not attempt to lead a sattvic lifestyle. By doing so, we make it easier for ourselves. But one who has attained and is established as a witness goes beyond the gunas and is established there and therefore he is merely observing. And by doing so, he becomes free from birth, old age and death. When you say he becomes free from birth, old age and death, it does not mean that he will not get old and he will not die. His body will age and he will die. The body will die. But the body bearer will remain established in himself and witness the departure of the pure consciousness from the matter, which is body. It will observe this separation. Any questions? Everybody is very quiet today. Perhaps the gunas is uh, a very um, slightly esoteric topic and uh, they require more contemplation. But if there are any doubts or comments, 
you're welcome anytime to to mention. Arjuna asked, with what characteristics is that one endowed who has transcended the three gunas, O Lord? What is his conduct? Having transcended the gunas, in what manner does he conduct himself? The Blessed Lord said, Illumination, activity as well as delusion, O Pandava. He is not adverse to these when they are operant, nor does he desire them when they have ceased. He who sits in neutrality is not moved by the gunas, observes merely that they operate with one another and does not respond. Alike to pain and pleasure, self-dwelling, beholding a lump of clay, stone and a nugget of gold is the same, holding the pleasant and the unpleasant as equal, endowed with wisdom, alike to praise and censure, alike in honour and dishonour, equal to the friendly or hostile sides, renouncing all endeavour, he is said to have transcended the gunas. So Arjun is quite fascinated by this idea of witnessing the gunas. And he wants to know how it is, how does such a person, a Sakshi, how does such a person appear? How does he behave? In what manner does he conduct himself? So we have heard this before. Sri Krishna has mentioned this before and I have said this before that this is not an instruction of how you should behave. It's a description of an, uh, a one who is a witness. It does not mean that the gunas stop or they cease to move they don't interact with each other anymore. It means that such a one witnesses he is a param vairagi. In the Yoga Sutras, this state is called param vairagya. In vairagya, you feel content and satisfied and the mind does not go outward. It's happy to go inward. But in param vairagya, one sees the gunas operating interacting with each other, one going up, the other going down, this continuous kind of movement among the three. But it does not in any way interfere with this. It may sound incredible, how can anybody be uh, alike to a, a friend or a foe? Because that person is merely witnessing. It may happen that from your perspective, somebody else may see him getting angry or, or uh, being friendly, appearing friendly. But internally, he is witnessing. He remains established in that witness, witnessing state. It's the mind that is then operating and moving with the gunas. Does that make sense? So the gunas come right after prakriti and so we are in a, a very uh, advanced state here and this is because we are speaking about gunas to clarify our understanding as Sri Krishna said right in the beginning 
we come back to these matters and we reiterate certain matters, explain again what a witness is like, how it is to be a witness. It's important to understand that this is not an instruction on how to behave. This is a description of how you could be in the future if you should become a witness. This brings us to the last verses of this chapter. He who serves me with an undeviated yoga of devotion, fully, transcend, fully transcending the gunas, he is fit to become Brahman. I am the fundament of the immortal and immutable Brahman of eternal law and of ultimate happiness. Prakriti or pure consciousness or purusha if you want to call it in this case is that which is immortal and eternal and leads to happiness, ultimate happiness. We all want to have happiness. We all want to experience that. Even if we do not say it clearly, we may not even be aware of it consciously. But in all our actions, all of us are evolving continuously. It may not appear like that. Externally, it may not appear like that. But through many, many, many innumerable lifetimes, we have evolved and finally acquired this body. And so this process will continue. This seeking of this eternal one, the seeking of ultimate happiness will continue. The one who finally realizes that that is what he wants and that's all he wants very consciously and transcends the gana, he attains that universal consciousness. He becomes one with all. He's no longer a separate individual. That sense of separateness is what causes our unhappiness. But the moment you feel connected to everybody and everything, then you feel extreme joy uh, without reason. Ultimate happiness is that feeling of being connected to everything. And transcending the gunas means there are no more separation between you and everybody around you. You have become one. One with all. That sounds like a nice state to be in, doesn't it? So this was the entire chapter on gunas, on the three gunas. I will not continue to the next chapter since we have only about five minutes to go. But if anybody has any questions, whether it's related to this chapter or in general, to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, then we have a few minutes for that. Or for that matter, any other doubts or questions?
good in that case everybody seems to be very content and contemplating on these very fine ideas we will continue then next friday with the next chapter chapter 15 as you know we are come we are drawing to an to the end of the bhagavad gita and uh, the next couple of chapters are, are short not not very long and uh, it's only chapter 18, which is, which is really long. So chapters you know, 15, 16, and 17 are, are rather short. And so it's very possible that we, we go much faster than, you know, than we normally do. And, uh, and maybe we complete the Bhagavad Gita in perhaps the next five or six uh, sessions. So I hope everybody had a nice um, contemplation and I wish you all a, a nice weekend. See you next Friday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.